In this video, I'm going to talk to you about Jaroflow and my complete start to finish guide on how to use it. So Jaroflow is one of the main softwares alongside Realsteady which you can use to produce stabilized footage using Jaro data. And because you're using Jaro data, it's very powerful at producing that stabilized footage. It produces great results and it's very configurable as well. So it makes it very attractive as a tool to be used. Now, in order to use Jaroflow, obviously you need a file which has either got Jaro data embedded within it or which can be linked to it. And one of the easiest ways to do that would be to use the uh, DJI Avata, for example, which can produce video files with Jaro data embedded into it. Or you could use the Defender 25 or a drone which contains the DJI O3 Air unit. All of those produce video files or can produce video files which contain Jaro data. Alternatively, you could also use some of the latest GoPros which can produce video files with Jaro data. Or you could use black box files from Betaflight and link those to your footage as well. So there's various different ways you can produce footage with Jaro data. I'm going to be using the DJI Avata because I like using this drone. It's very good at producing video files with Jaro data. So that's what we're going to be using. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find a location and capture some footage. But before that, I'm also going to talk to you about whether it's best to use Jaroflow or maybe consider using something like uh, Rocksteady, which is a stabilization feature built into this drone and can actually be a better choice in some circumstances because Jaroflow in my experience isn't always the best choice. And I'll talk to you about the reasons for that in a second. So let's find a location and I'll see you there. So we are at one of my favorite flying locations and today it's very windy and that's a good thing for once because in order to show off what Jaroflow is capable of, I need really nice shaky footage. If it weren't this windy, you might actually want to uh, prefer to use uh, Rocksteady instead, because Rocksteady does have some distinct advantages. That's my first point to consider when you get to a location. You might actually want to opt to Rocksteady over Gyroflow or Gyroflow over Rocksteady, depending on the conditions. Rocksteady does not stabilize your footage as good as Gyroflow does, and it's very limited in terms of your parameters of stabilization. However, it does retain more detail, I've found. It crops the image less. You can record in super wide, which will utilize the full sensor in something like the Avata. Bear in mind that if you use wide uh, filming, you are cropping in on that sensor already. And with Gyroflow, you have to film in wide. And on top of that, Gyroflow will then further crop into that image even more. So you're losing even more of that, so that image. So your native quality is actually gonna be nothing like 4K. It'll probably be something like 2.7K or even less upscale to 4K. So that's something bear, worth bearing in mind um, that your image quality could suffer a little bit. But Gyroflow would be better at stabilizing. But for the best image quality, I would use Rocksteady myself. But that depends on the different conditions. Windy conditions like this, it's going to shake all over the place. And regardless how good your image quality is going to be, it's just going to be shaky and horrible. So they're the kind of advantages. The other advantage with Rocksteady is there's less processing to do. You get a stabilized image out of the box. Nothing else to do other than doing your normal editing afterwards. So that's a nice feature. Jaroflow, on the other hand, does provide you with a much more flexible and powerful way of stabilizing. So at the expense of a little bit of image quality, you will be able to adjust your parameters. It's a bit of an insurance policy as well. So if, for example, you only get one go at taking a shot, you will be able to go back at that uh, the, at, into Jaroflow and adjust your parameters accordingly. With Rocksteady, if you've messed something up, if you've got a little bit of shake in there, it is what it is, you can't change that. You could run it through something like Warp Stabilizer in Premiere, but that, that'd be quite limiting. So if you mess it up, you'll be screwed. With Gyroflow, you get that flexibility of going back, adjusting it, tweaking your parameters and getting it just how you want it. So that's one, another benefit with it. The other thing with Gyroflow is it will take care of your lens distortion as well. So if you want a nice level horizon, it'll do that automatically. But again, at the expense of some distortion at the edges. And if you look at a side-by-side -side comparison of images from Rocksteady versus Gyroflow, you'll see that the image does get distorted quite a bit. So it depends on whether you want that or not. But yeah, the second point to get onto is that you want to consider your frame rate. Now, there's a trend going around that everyone wants to use 30 frames per second, 25 frames per second for nice motion blur and that cinematic footage. But one thing that I've noticed myself in very windy conditions where you get a lot of shake, in particular on the yaw axis, and the drone kind of does this a lot, 
is that that shake at uh, low frames per second will translate into very blurry pixels and I found that gyro flow can struggle to stabilize that out so what I've actually found is in those conditions so when it's, when it's very windy I would stay away from 30 frames per second and I would stick to something like 60 frames per second. Yes, you sacrifice a little bit of motion blur, but you will get much better stabilization. If you must use 30 frames per second in conditions like this, you might actually still be better using Rocksteady then, because even though Rocksteady won't stabilize out your general motion of the uh, drone as well as gyro flow, it will kind of stop those glitchy types sort of um, distortions and artifacts that you might get at 30 frames per second. But in these conditions I'm going to be filming at 60 frames per second to hopefully give us the most opt optimal results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off, I'm going to run you through the settings you need to go through in order to record footage suitable for gyro flow. There's not much to do, it's just a couple of things you need to set up and make sure that's set right. And I'm going to take a bit of footage, show you what that looks like beforehand. And then I'll go back to the studio and uh, run you through how you use Gyroflow to hopefully produce very nice, silky smooth footage using Gyroflow. So I hope you enjoy the video. Uh, let's get flying and I'll run you through the setup. Okay, so I've just taken off and the first thing I'm going to do is bring up my camera settings. I'm going to be filming in manual mode but with ISO set to automatic. So that allows me to keep a constant shutter speed but the ISO is going to just going to take care of some slight changes in the exposure. There's two things you need to change in order to get uh, gyro flow ready footage. First one is your camera field of view needs to be in wide, so it will not work in ultra wide. And the other one is that your image stabilization has to be turned off. So if you're recording Rocksteady, you will not record any gyro data on that file. So if you turn this off and click OK, you will now have the required gyro data baked into the video file as it's saved and that'll be ready to be used in Gyroflow. As far as the other parameters are concerned, um, I'm going to be recording at 60 frames per second. As mentioned earlier, it is very windy and I would anticipate that the footage would create artifacts if I was recording at 30 frames per second and then stabilizing with Gyroflow. And that's just because the uh, the image will just struggle to lock onto pixels, um, which will be too blurry and too movie um, in order to stabilize it. So 60 frames per second will keep those pixels crisp enough for the um, gyro flow to stabilize your footage. Uh, other parts, 16 by 9, uh, white balance. So this is a little trick I normally use. Um, if you want to use constant white balance, get your shot set up set it to auto white balance to give you an idea what the uh, white balance is in those conditions so it's 5500 Kelvin and then go back and actually set it fixed to that white balance so that'll stop the white balance from changing while you're flying so I'm using auto white balance to establish the white balance but then fixing in place where it is so it's 55 and also auto ISO limit I would set this to 400 or 800 Anything more than 800, you'll find the uh, footage is just going to get too grainy. So, um, yeah, I'm going to have also auto ISO limit of 400 just to allow you a bit of flexibility of the um, the exposure to adapt itself to the conditions. And that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to record in uh, decent light, obviously that's your choice. So I'm just going to do it in normal. And you can see from that horizon tilt how windy it is. I mean, it's proper, proper windy out there at the moment. Uh, that's pretty much it as far as the settings are concerned. Um, there you go, you can see the high wind velocity warning on the screen. So I'm going to start recording some footage now. Uh, once I'm done with this, I'll get back to the studio with you and run you through how you can use Gyroflow to create nice, silky smooth footage from what we've created.
in the studio. Hope you enjoyed our little trip to the beach. Now I've got an Avata full of exciting FPV footage which is waiting to be stabilized. So let's get straight onto it. And the first thing you want to, want to do, unless you've already done it, is download the JaraFlow software. So the simplest way to do it is you can either uh, Google search JaraFlow download or you can go to jaraflow.xyz and click on that. And the latest version at the time of this recording is version 1.5. 5.0 and I'm using a uh, MacBook Pro so we're going to be downloading the Mac OS. Click on download. I'm going to close this window now and that's all there is to it um, in terms of the installation. If you go to do your downloads you'll find the Jaraflow hyphen Max Universal DMG. If you double click on that you'll have the Jaraflow um, software there and then double clicking on that will open this uh, Jaraflow drive and click open on the pop-up and that's pretty much all there is so JaraFlow is ready to go i'll assume that you've already downloaded your software from the drone that you're using or the avatar if not obviously pop your sd card into the um, computer or macbook or connect it via usb-c to download your footage save it in a safe place that you can find easily and all we're now going to do is click on open file and choose the video file that you've saved onto your device. So it's going to be this one. Now, if your video file does not contain any Jira data, um, JaraFlow will alert you of that and you'll know you've got the wrong file or perhaps you didn't set it up right. But if you followed the instructions I gave you at the beach, um, your footage should have Jira data embedded and you should be good to go. So I'm going to click on this, click open, and there's your footage right there ready to be viewed. Now first of all you've got two columns here. Now the left column in most cases you won't have to do anything to this. This is basically just um, your set uh, basic importing settings. Um, you've got your video information here, your file name, your length of the clip, frame rate and so on. So nothing needs to be done on this first section here. Moving down you've got the lens profile. Now the lens profile I've had a look and for the Avata I couldn't find a specific lens profile. Obviously if you're lucky enough and you've got a um, drone that has a lens profile within the library then obviously you might want to use it. In this case I've had a look on DJI FPV for example. We've got a few lens profiles there. I don't know, I don't think if these are specific to the Avata or the actual DJI FPV drone. But what I found is that the default settings, if you just leave this blank, work really well so you won't have to do anything to this. So it's chosen DJI FC8183 and that device works really well so you won't have to change anything on that if you use the Avata. Moving to the next section you've got motion data. Now motion data you won't have to do anything to either in this case because that's specific to if you use the instance of um, black box recordings from Betaflight and then linking the Jaro data from that to your footage. In this case, we're using footage that's already got the Jaro data embedded, so you won't have to do anything to that, but that's the option that you have. So now we get onto the exciting part, which is this central section of the screen, which gives you your preview. And this is something that JaraFlow really excels at, at very, very fast and smoothly previewing your footage before you've even rendered it. And that's incredibly handy because once you start playing with uh, various factors, various variables, it gives you an instantaneous view of what effect those changes have made, whether you're going in the right direction or whether you might want to dial things back a bit without having to render things back and forth and wasting time. So that's something that JaraFlow is really good at. So you've got your preview here. At the bottom, you've got the uh, Jara, um, Jara data. So these two lines are basically what the Jaras are doing. And you can see these parts here where you might, I might have done like a flip or a dive or something like that. Um, and we have the option of toggling the stabilization on and off. So if I press play, I'm gonna keep this playing while we talk through all this. You can also select in and out points using the uh, brackets here. So while it's playing back the, uh, the footage, which is now stabilized in this preview, um, we can click on toggle stabilization and turn that on and off to see what's happening. So this is without stabilization. You can see the lens corrections um, before and after. So JaraFlow does, um, does apply a nice level of lens correction, gives you a nice level horizon, which is nice. And then we can turn that back on again. And this is just using the default settings. So the bottom line I can point out at this stage is that the default settings on JaraFlow actually work really, really well. So you might find you don't need to change anything at all and you'll get great results out of this. But keep watching the video because I might have something useful to tell you in a minute. But 
If you've never used it before, just plug in your files and give it a go because you might find you'll get great results just as it is. And that's great. Now look at this right column. This is your variables that you can change. And the top one, this is synchronization. It's set to auto sync by default. And I would leave it on that. There's no need to change that. The second section, and uh, these are probably the main things you might want to have a little play around with. Your field of view, it's by default is set to one. And again, one works really well. If you increase this, you start to get black sort of bars that uh, appear at the top and bottom, which obviously you don't want. So you'll have to be careful how much you increase it by um, small amounts you might get away with. Obviously you can decrease it as well. But uh, about one is probably gonna be where you want to be. So we'll stick this back to one. The next section we've then got, and this is probably one of the main things you might want to have a little play with, is your smoothness. So the smoothness is basically the amount of stabilization that's applied to your footage. The higher the number, the more stabilization, the more smoother the footage, the lower and the less stabilization you apply, apply to it. Now you might think, well, I want the maximum smoothness because obviously smooth is better. Well, the problem is if you go too high on it, the footage can look, uns it can look unnatural and just unreal. So I would be careful on how high I dial this. Levels between 0.4 and 0.5 are probably about right. Um, anything much higher than 0.5 might be a bit too excessive and it'll just look weird. So I'll stick to 0.5 for the default, but that is definitely one of those settings that you might want to have a little play with because it's, it's worth, uh, worth dialing that up and down depending on your liking. Now, if we click on advanced, we can actually click on per axis and you'd have the option of adjusting your pitch smoothness, your smoothness and roll smoothness independently. So if you find that it's just got a, looking a bit too uh, jerky along the your axis, for example, you can adjust that without affecting the other axes in turn. But in most cases, you'll probably find that the overall smoothness for all three axes will work well enough. So the next section we have the max smoothness and max smoothness at high velocities. These can be useful if you find that the smoothness or the stabilization kicks in a bit too aggressively. It could be that you're doing a fast turn and I found in that sort of instance, the um, stabilization kind of zooms in quite excessively and does too much. So you can dial this up and down depending on what's happening there. Again, I don't find these ones need to be changed much, but if you need to, that's uh, where these two can be useful. Um, but I would probably leave this to, to default and just play around with the smoothness setting up here. Look at this next uh, next feature. You've got the lock horizon. So with the Avata, for example, you can produce horizon locked uh, footage um, as one of the options. But what you can actually do in Jira Flow is you can create something similar by clicking lock horizon and it'll now stabilize your horizon like this. The downside with this is that the amount of crop that's required to keep your horizon level if you do tilting or sort of heavy um, a, a roll uh, maneuvers, it can be quite excessive and you'll find it'll really zoom in on that footage and you lose a lot of detail and you're cropping in on a small portion of the footage. So I'm gonna show you right now, it's actually gonna, as I'm flying up here, I'm gonna start doing a dive and obviously because I'm rolling to the right, it's zooming excessively into that image and you're losing a lot of information. So it's, it might be useful to some, depending on how you fly, but I would turn it off because if you fly FPV, you're gonna be um, wanting a little bit of roll in there anyway. So we'll turn that off again. Um, then we've got dynamic zooming. By default, it's set to dynamic zoom. We can have a static zoom as well. So dynamic zoom basically means that as you're flying around, it will zoom in and out depending on the amount of crop that's required to achieve the stabilization that you need. So obviously you don't want an excessive amount of zoom all the time because you're losing information, you're using parts of the image, um, but you want enough zooming to allow you to stabilize the image and take out any shake. So setting to static zoom will stop it from hunting in and out of the image constantly, but it does have the downside that it'll probably choose one of the higher zoom levels. So we can actually see down here in the bottom, zoom 115, which is a quite a high crop. I mean, you're already cropping in anyway by using wide on the Avata, um, and then you're cropping even further, you're losing a lot of the image, and that can be an undesired effect. But if you find that that hunting in and out, sort of zooming effect is undesirable and doesn't look very nice for your footage, then you could get around it by setting static zoom. But otherwise, I would probably set it back to dynamic zoom, because as we, as we can see right now, we're going back to zoom levels of well, less than 100%. So you're retaining more of the image that you've filmed. And that's what we want normally. Um, the zoom speed is set to four seconds. 
if you find the zooming happens too fast, you can reduce that. Um, again, having a high zooming speed uh, can have an undesirable effect of look, making the footage look unnatural. So I would play around with it if you need to. If it's zooming too fast or too slow, you can adjust it with this. But I would probably leave it to four seconds. But in some cases I've found that uh, the zoom speed can be a bit excessive at times and it'll just make it really obvious that the camera's zooming in on something and that's not what you want. That zooming should be quite subtle as part of your FPV footage. Now, next, if we click on advanced, uh, you get the options of setting your zooming method. I would just keep, keep this on the Gaussian filter. And you've also got the option of changing your zooming center offset. This could be useful that in if your zoom focuses on the wrong part of your frame, maybe it's zooming away from your uh, point of interest, you could change that uh, center offset to ensure that when zoom does take place, it'll actually zoom it in on the um, uh, uh, point of interest rather than zooming away from it, for example. So that could be interesting. Probably won't have to use it very often, but the option is there and that's a nice option to have. Rolling shutter correction I would leave on. You shouldn't have to change that. Uh, lens correction strength. As mentioned earlier, the um, gyroflow does do a very nice job at um, correcting your lens. You've got a nice level straight horizon. If you don't want that, you could dial this down from 100% and reintroduce some lens distortion. I don't know why you'd want that, uh, but the option is there if you want it. So we'll set it back to 100. And then we've got the video speed at the bottom, which can be changed to higher levels. So you could choose 200 if you want to. I mean, even at 200%, it's still running the footage smoothly. And just, I mean, it, it's just amazing how it does it. It's just absolutely amazing how quick it can render and preview your footage like this. Uh, so we'll set this back to 100 though. And that's pretty much all the settings you might want to change. So the main settings really are things like the smoothness, maybe individually per axis if you require that, uh, max smoothness possibly, um, your zooming if it's doing something weird to your footage that you want, if it's zooming too excessively or it's, if you don't require much zooming anyway, um, but be aware that you're gonna lose some of your frame as part of that. Um, the other thing that I've actually I forgot to mention is your second smoothing pass. Um, that's something that, again, you shouldn't really have to use. Um, it's basically just, it's like any filter. It's gonna apply another pass on top of it. Could create some smoother footage for you, but in most cases, I wouldn't use it because you're gonna crop in even more on the image. So if I use this right now, um, if you look at the left side of the screen and apply the second smoothing pass, you've just lost a little bit of detail. It's not much, but you're constantly losing details part of the stabilization anyway, and you don't want to lose too much. So I wouldn't use it unless I have to, but the option's there, and that's how you choose it. So a second smoothing pass, possibly a little bit more stability or a bit more smoothing, but at the expense of more of your image, and you might not want that. Once you've done all of this and you're happy with your footage, to export, you just click on the export button down here and it's gonna use the default settings which are down here in the export settings. And you can change those settings if you want to. So you could use uh, choose H.264 or H.265 if you require. Um, your output size will be correlating to your input footage, so that should be fine. Your bit rate, 143 megabits per second is quite decent, so I would keep that to what it is and GPU encoding and all that, that's all fine. So my experience, what I normally find is with the length of time that uh, Dryflow takes to um, uh, render your footage, it's with a device like this, with the um, MacBook um, M1, it would take about one and a half to two times the length of the footage. So something like this, which is a four, so two minute clip, um, would take about three to four minutes to render, which is quite reasonable, so it's quite good. Uh, there's nothing else really that needs to be changed as part of your export settings. So I would then click on export and it'll start rendering and it'll give you a preview of your frames per second and your rendering uh, progress and um, the remaining time. So it does work really well.
And that's all there is to using Jaroflow. So I'm sure you agree it's actually very, very straightforward. The default settings on Jaroflow work really well. You probably won't have to change them too much. Maybe play around with the smoothness a little bit, dynamic zooming versus static zooming and um, your zooming speed. But everything else should really work really well, which is one of the great things about this software. The other great thing about it is it's absolutely free. So you can download it and provide you've got a drone like the Avatar, which can produce Jaroflow ready footage you can give it a go and hopefully produce some beautiful, smooth shots. So I hope you found this useful and I hope you learned something from it. If you did, please remember to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And also just write something in the comments below on what sort of videos you might want me to make for you because I enjoy reading those and taking them into account. Other than that, happy flying, get some smooth footage, enjoy using Dryerflow and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.